Good morning, good afternoon uh, to our friends around the world. This is Ipek Cem Taha. Uh, I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers uh, in Istanbul, and we're delighted uh, today uh, to be hosting a Kapuczynski Development Lecture with the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz on the post-pandemic world, restructuring globalization for the global public good, moderated by Anya Schifrin. Thanks for joining us. Kapuscinski Development Lectures are a series of meetings with top development thinkers organized by the European Commission, United Nations Development Council, and partner universities and think tanks. These lectures honor Richard Kapuscinski, Polish writer and journalist who was named the voice of the poor for his coverage of developing countries. Indeed, the pandemic has caught us all unprepared and made us rethink our ways to better serve human needs and restructure globalization for the public good. In a recent lecture, Professor Stiglitz said, this is not an equal opportunity virus. It goes after those that are most vulnerable. In fact, this is the moment to redefine globalization to hopefully leave no one behind. Before move on to, we move on to this timely lecture, I would like to pass the word to Jutta Urpilainen, European Commissioner for International Partnerships, for her opening remarks. Jutta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ipek, and good afternoon from Brussels. It is an honor to introduce Kapuczynski Development Lecture. I thank the United Nations Development Program and Colombia uh, Global Centers for bringing us together in this virtual setting. In the over 100 Kapuczynski development lectures developed, uh, de de delivered so far, we have heard well-known figures speak about international partnerships and sustainable development. And today is no exception. Our guest lecture a Nobel laureate in economics, Professor Stiglitz, who I have had the pleasure to meet several times uh, in person, will be discussing with us the sustainable recovery from, from the pandemic. Even before COVID-19, many countries faced big challenges. The climate change, the digital uh, divide, and persistent inequalities were all true. COVID-19 has made the situation even worse. The weakest again suffer the most. Many children are missing out on distance learning. Small businesses are going under and people with no social safety nets are losing their livelihoods. More than 2 million people have no access to clean water and sanitation that are so vital in fighting this terrible crisis and virus. So how can we possibly accept this in our 21st century world? This is a crucial question. And I think the answer is we cannot accept this. This is why the European Union works for a global recovery that is green, digital, resilient, and just. A recovery that links investments and debt relief to the sustainable development goals. We must begin by building greener and bluer economies. Our recovery must be mindful of the needs of generations present and future for the youth. We must build a digital future that opens up uh, access and opportunities for all. The EU, it may, its member states and the European financial institutions have joined forces and as Team Europe, we have already secured over 36 billion euros to global response to emergency assistance or longer term support. None of us is safe until we all are safe. So we will continue working with partners to secure for all the vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. 
Dear friends, the beat the global pandemic and recover together, we need strong multilateralism. As President von der Leyen put it, there is a need to reform the multilateral system to make it fit for today's challenges. The blueprints are there in the form of the uh, 2030 Agenda or Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. And you can trust, dear friends, that the EU will remain a reliable partner on this joint journey. Team Europe will fight against inequalities and keep the green and digital transitions as our roadmap. Together, we will make our societies more resilient and inclusive. We have a once in a generation chance to build a fair, more sustainable and more resilient future. So let's use this opportunity. I thank you for their attention. And like you, I'm very excited to hear thoughts uh, from Professor Stiglitz. Thank you. Thank you, Jutta, for those words of wisdom and the uh, European Union's pledge for the future. I hope that we will uh, live to see uh, all of those uh, developments. Now I'd like to pass the microphone, so to speak, to Mirjana Spoljaric, UN Assistant General Secretary General and Director of the UNDP Regional Bureau for Europe and Central Asia. Mirjana? Thank you. Thank you, Ipek. And Dear colleagues, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Stieglitz for accepting the invitation to the Kapuczynski Lecture Series. And I also thank our strategic partner, the European Commission and Commissioner Orpilainen, for the close partnership and continued joint effort in raising awareness on sustainable development. And let me also thank the Columbia Global Centers Istanbul for hosting this event. Professor Stieglitz, you received the Nobel Prize for your work on the economics of imperfect information. And in many countries today, information as well as disinformation are at the heart of COVID-19. This goes beyond standard financial system concerns, such as growing debt burdens across the globe. It is also apparent in questions about the veracity of the epidemiological data reported by governments the traction of conspiracy theories, and seeming flip-flops in the information and advice provided by relevant institutions. And this only underscores the importance of addressing institutional imperfections in post-pandemic reconstruction efforts. And building back better is also about developing better policies, policies that can ensure the security and well-being of future generations and the planet. And just like sustainable development per se, effective pandemic response is very much about thinking globally and acting locally. And there is an unquestionable need for global response to COVID-19 as the virus does not recognize national borders. But likewise, national governments need to find the space for expansionary fiscal and monetary policies to offset the macroeconomic shocks associated with the pandemic and public health responses. But striking the right balance between public health, socioeconomic development and personal freedoms is also a local affair that should reflect such local specifics as population density, the workplace health policies of leading employers, extent of informality, local health infrastructure and the digital inclusion of societies. We as UNDP look forward to stepping up this local work and area-based development in general. And as the UN Development Programme, we also see a number of declines in social welfare unfolding because of the pandemic. One of our biggest concerns is an apparent acceleration in inequality and increase in poverty, especially for youth and women, but generally for those already vulnerable. UNDP has therefore led the technical UN work on socioeconomic impact assessments and initial results from more than 70 developing countries 
suggest cause for deep concern regarding employment and access to services for people working informally. And like many others today, I will therefore be particularly interested to hear you, uh, Professor Stieglitz, on the international debt landscape and managing social policy reorientation while also returning to growth in the post-COVID recovery. I look forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mirjana, uh, for that synopsis from the UNDP and also for the focus on inequality. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome again Joe Stiglitz and invite him to uh, deliver his lecture. Thank you. I'll, I'll just speak first for a minute. Uh, okay. Thank you, everybody. Just a little housekeeping. Um, Professor Stiglitz will speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll be reading the questions in the Q&A so that he will <clears throat> be able to answer them. So um, thank you very much. As a longtime fan of Kapuscinski, I still uh, have all the books I bought in the 1980s. Those battered paperbacks are still in our shelves at home. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'll take myself out of the frame, and I will come back for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here to, to address you on, on uh, some of the post-COVID issues. One of the things uh, about this uh, pandemic is that it has taught us uh, a lot of lessons uh, about society, about e uh, e economics. Um, it's been what economists, social scientists refer to as a natural experiment. It's affected uh, countries all over the world, but they've responded very differently. Some countries have been very successful in controlling the pandemic. Some countries like the United States, Brazil, India have been a miserable failure. Some countries have been very successful in controlling the economic aftermath of the pandemic. Denmark, New Zealand are examples of exemplary performance. Other countries, again, including the United States, the economic aftermath has been devastating. So it's natural to ask the question, what can we learn from the successes and the failures? Are there any generalizations? And I think the answer is uh, yes. It's not an accident, I think, that the countries that have done well in controlling the pandemic have also done well in controlling the economic aftermath of the pandemic. What we've seen is uh, that the countries uh, that have uh, recognized the importance of science uh, have done better. Uh, countries that have recognized the importance of institutions, uh, the institutions that respond to a crisis, that respond to an infectious disease, uh, they have done better. In countries where there is greater respect of citizens for each other uh, have done better. After all, one of the critical aspects of the pandemic is that it's an infectious disease. And therefore, those who change behaviors to uh, reflect respect for each other, maintaining social distancing, wearing masks, have done better. And those like the United States, where the leadership has flaunted these basic norms of decency and respect have done very poorly. So these are actually themes that I raised in my book, People, Power, and Profits, uh, where I asked the question, how can we account for the success of uh, some countries in the last 250 years, why have some countries been able to raise standards of living so much in that period of time? And it comes down to the factors that I've just described. Science, social organization, trust, um, credibility, truth, uh, it, it creating institutions for verifying and assessing the truth. In countries where no one believes anything, where there's 
rampant misinformation uh, have not done very well. As was mentioned, uh, my Nobel Prize was for work in economics of information, uh, for concerns about how there could be asymmetries of information where some people know things that others uh, did not know. But I had never fully grasped the importance of the concept of misinformation, where some citizens engage in an attempt to uh, misinform, deceive uh, others. Uh, we have created in many realms uh, institutions to try to discourage this, fraud laws, uh, laws about truth in advertising. But the new era of social media has undermined all these precepts. And uh, some of the uh, leading social media, like Facebook, have openly said that they will not do anything even to stop the virality of uh, misinformation, particularly when it's concerned with politics. So uh, we are now at a point where the, there are these very disparate outcomes. Hopefully, in coming uh, months, we will be able to uh, uh, roll back the pandemic. And then we will face the challenge of constructing the post-pandemic uh, world. And I want to say uh, uh, a few things about that. At the beginning, there was hope that it would be a short economic downturn, a few weeks. And the packages that were passed in the spring were predicated on a V-shaped recovery. Most of them were designed to end in early or late June at the latest. Well, we're in October, and it's clear that the pandemic is still not under the control. Uh, many countries are experiencing a second or third wave. Well, as the pandemic has continued, we have realized that, as was mentioned in the introduction, that it's not an equal opportunity virus. Uh, it has exposed and exacerbated the inequalities in our society. So one of the things that there's a global consensus about is that we don't want to go back to the world as it was in January 2020. We don't want a bounce back to where we were. We want to build back better, to use the words of Vice President Biden. While we've been fighting the pandemic, we've also seen the consequences of climate change raging, particularly in the United States. Fires, unprecedented fires in California, floods in Iowa, hurricanes. They are an ever-present reminder of the ravages that climate change will present unless we do something about it. So we have to build back better, create more equal societies, greener societies, based uh, uh, societies uh, that are more knowledge-based, uh, transforming our societies to the 21st century economies and societies that we would like to have. That, in turn, means that we will have to make sure that the money that we spend does double or triple duty. Governments have never spent as much money as they have in response to the pandemic. In the United States, uh, we've had $3 trillion of fiscal support, $3 trillion of expansion of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And therefore, citizens have the right to demand that their governments shape the post-pandemic economy according to their values. And that's why the kind of green, more equal, uh, more knowledge-based digital economy is what we should be demanding. One thing that some of my research that I've done with colleagues at uh, Oxford University, like uh, Cameron Hepburn and Nick Stern, uh, has been to show that 
spending on green can actually be uh, more effective than other kinds of spending. It can be timely, it can be labor intensive, addressing the, uh, the needs of those uh, uh, driving up wages, and it can have high multipliers, that is, give uh, high levels of bang for the buck. Uh, it can have the kind of flexibility that responds to uh, the uh, uncertainties of the pandemic itself. So this is going to be one of the imperatives and European Union has actually done a very good job of, of setting out a vision of what that kind of recovery should look like. Unfortunately, in my own country, United States, uh, the Democrats have had to battle just to get an adequate recovery, let alone a recovery uh, with some vision. Hopefully that will change. I wanna spend now just a few minutes talking about some of the international dimensions of this post-pandemic world. There are several aspects of this. First, globalization itself. The pandemic has shown some of the problems with globalization. Global supply chains, chains were not resilient. Even a rich country like the United States couldn't produce simple products like masks or protective gear, let alone the more complicated uh, products like ventilators or tests. Uh, markets were short-sighted, as we saw in the 2008 crisis. And uh, then the consequences of that short-sightedness uh, led, uh, uh, created the global financial crisis of 2008. Now we're seeing that same kind of short-sightedness has hampered our ability to respond to the crisis. So it's important going forward that we create more resilient supply chains, uh, that we understand that that kind of short-sightedness that has been part of both economics and politics imposes unacceptable risks on our societies. On the other hand, the pandemic has shown that we need global cooperation. As was pointed out, we won't have a world safe from this virus until every country is safe. But that's where there's been uh, uh, some ugly uh, aspects coming from places that formerly were leadership, that had exercised leadership in global uh, cooperation from the United States, where we've seen vaccine nativism uh, rather than uh, sharing knowledge, there's an attempt to uh, hoard knowledge and to uh, use this as an opportunity for profits on the part of some corporations. It's remarkable how the scientific community around the world, the academic community around the world has cooperated, cooperated in an unprecedented way. But as I said, some governments uh, have lagged. A few governments have shown the way. Costa Rica has uh, uh, led the way in creating in the World Health Organization initiative for the sharing of all global knowledge related to the pandemic. And I hope all corporate, all companies and all governments will eventually join this kind of initiative. So climate change, the pandemic, have shown that we never before have we needed more cooperation. There will be some difficulties. The era of uh, Pollyannish uh, optimism that uh, the end of the Cold War in 1990 brought about, that we would all converge to liberal democracies and free market economies, uh, that has been dashed. We've seen with the uh, um, uh, attack against human rights in some countries, attacks and democracies in many countries, that we are not quickly converging. And even 
of global trade has not accelerated the process in the way that it was hoped. It looks as if we will live in a world where there will be some democracies, but some countries openly shunning democracies. There will be some countries advocating human rights, although not necessarily fully living up to their ideals, but other countries looking the other way. We will have to learn to cooperate with countries whose values we do not, disagree, we do not agree with. Uh, it, when you're in a rowboat uh, uh, from a sinking ship like the Titanic, there may be people in that boat uh, the, uh, that you don't like. But the first challenge is to get to shore. And our challenge in the world is to fight the uh, scourges of, of climate change and pandemics. And we have to fight, cooperate to do that. Among the areas where we will have to cooperate will have to be in the areas of helping developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, that, that advanced countries have spent enormous amounts of money. The developing countries and emerging markets don't have the resources to maintain their economies in the way that Europe and the United States have done. But there are ways in which the international community can help. The first is, it is very likely that there will be number, numerous debt crises. We're already seeing uh, some of these. Uh, in the years after uh, the uh, jubilee, the debt forgiveness of HIPAA, many a con countries got, unfortunately, overly indebted. And especially after 2008, when interest rates reached very high, very low levels, unprecedented low levels for an extended period of time, and many Western banks pushed uh, debt on developing countries. Uh, so we are in a situation where me the many countries have debt beyond their ability to manage. The G20 has recognized the, uh, the importance of this problem, they've called for debt stays, but debt stays only for the least developed countries and debt stays only for official debt. They haven't talked about uh, private debt and a very large fraction of debt today is private and they haven't talked about emerging markets and these will be very uh, adversely affected. And most importantly, what is required is not just to stay in debt payments. There will have to be restructuring. In the aftermath of the 2008-09 uh, financial crisis, the president of the uh, UN General Assembly asked me to head a commission that looked at some of the reforms in the global financial architecture. And one of our strong recommendations was the creation of a framework for restructuring sovereign debt. That call got reflected in uh, uh, resolutions that were passed and by the General Assembly in 2014, and a set of principles that was adopted almost unanimously, though only a few countries dissenting in 2015. But unfortunately, among the countries dissenting were some of the major creditor countries, including the United States. And so today, as we face another debt crisis, there are not the institutions that we need to help us facilitate those debt restructurings. The likelihood is that we will have another experience of too little, too late, of the kind that we've seen over and over again. It is worth noting that the IMF has called for this kind of new institution and very, uh, this morning, today, the Financial Times uh, had a lead editorial calling for this kind of uh, sovereign debt restructuring framework. So I hope that's one of the things that will emerge going forward. But that will take time. And in the meanwhile, we have to act and act quickly. The creditor countries should encourage sovereign debt restructuring, 
the multilateral uh, institutions, the IMF, should continue their work encouraging these kinds of sovereign debt uh, restructurings. Uh, we may uh, employ techniques such as uh, the kind of technique that I, I urged with a colleague, uh, Hamid Rashi, uh, where we would uh, have a debt buybacks, uh, a mechanism that has proved useful sometimes in the past. That's one important initiative. A second important initiative is uh, direct help. In this moment where uh, debt uh, in the advanced countries is rising, governments are, are spending far beyond their revenues, there is still one mechanism that's available. The G20 called for all available instruments to be used, but unfortunately, that has not happened. The instrument that has not been adequately used is special drawing rights, SDRs. There's already an authorization, uh, a framework for creating these. All it takes is a vote of the board of the IMF. And the IMF has called for this, uh, 500 billion. Unfortunately, two countries voted against, India and the United States. For no reason that anybody has been able to understand. Um, so uh, going forward, uh, I, this is uh, an instrument that we have to adopt. It is, uh, uh, as a hopeful sign, uh, it is worth noting that in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, the Democrats have introduced legislation calling for a $2 trillion issuance of SDRs. We won't have a global recovery, a strong, robust global recovery, unless we have a robust recovery in every part of the world. The recovery from this pandemic will be more difficult than the recovery from the 2008 crisis. And that's why these initiatives to help the developing countries and emerging markets recover are not just a matter of uh, a charity, uh, not a, just a, a moral issue. It is in the self-interest of the advanced countries to make sure that the developing countries and emerging markets have uh, the kind of robust recovery that the advanced countries themselves are working so hard to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I see Agnieszki from joining us. And a number Hi, everybody. I'm here to, I was trying to look at the questions on the other uh, laptop, but it was making too much noise. So I see we have a whole lot of questions about pandemics and how to deal with them, about the Swedish model, um, about how developing countries will be able to access um, finance so that they can do infrastructure development and other things that they need. Uh, more, more information on fake news, which we can talk about forever, um, and questions about green spending. So this is a lot of very, very different topics. I don't know which <laughs> ones you want to take first. Um, I can obviously take the, the fake news one myself. So why don't we begin with uh, misinformation? Uh, should we begin with misinformation? Because uh, that's uh, become a, a, a real problem. Uh, the anti-vax movement uh, was, was there before the pandemic. And uh, uh, it was interesting that many of the social media said that there was nothing they uh, could do about it. And then why don't you come in and talk oh, okay. about- Good. I've been, um, sorry to take away the spotlight here from Joe for a minute. I've been, I'm teaching a new Columbia course on solutions for mis and disinformation online. And what I do in that course is I look at the universe of solutions. There's probably about 10 things at least that are being tried right now. So one is media literacy, which is to try to educate the public so as to be aware of what is false and what is not. 
There are fact-checking organizations around the world that are putting out debunking and when someone like Bolsonaro or Modi or Trump says something that's just simply not scientific, they call him out, they expose, they expose the lies and the disinformation. There are big attempts by journalists to engage with audiences and to make uh, journalism more inclusive um, and more representative of people's voices. There are journalists exposing the disinformation networks. And now I would say there are a lot more really good ideas about policy measures that can be taken. And I'm, I myself am quite excited about these. And, and so is Joe, I would say. So for example, uh, Rebecca McKinnon and Natalie Marischal have just put out a report about the importance of privacy regulation and the importance of limiting micro-targeting. So part of why all these messages are so effective is because they are targeted at particular people. So if that could be limited, that might make this messaging less effective. There's also Reporters Without Borders is working on a report right now, which will lift up some of the very good ideas about what to do with closed messaging apps. So there's a whole lot of regulation that probably needs to happen around the world. Um, some of what Germany and France have done as well, uh, making the tech companies liable in some ways uh, for what they put on the platforms, the, the third party content is going to be really important. And I think that the policymakers that are working on this, and I really applaud the, what the EU has, is trying to do, are very aware of the fact that they need to respect all the international conventions and UN agreements on free expression, but we do need to start regulating the tech companies in a much more serious way. Um, anybody who's interested in this subject, I'll, my final thought is to take a look at what Australia is doing right now of uh, forcing Google and Facebook to actually pay for the news they use. And this will help sort of improve the balance between journalism and the big tech companies. Um, I won't talk about all the threats to freedom of expression that we've seen in places like Turkey, India, Brazil, the United States, China, among others, but that's also part of the big, you know, disinformation, misinformation problem. So I think I've talked long enough. Um, did you but, want to answer questions yep. about finance or Green New Deal, or did you want to add to anything I just First said? First let me add just one thing that, that links to what I said in my talk, which is uh, countries like the United States and some of the other countries that Anya mentioned that have so uh, distrust, uh, skepticism about what is the truth uh, have undermined the ability of citizens to uh, assess uh, what is going on. And so there's widespread uh, uh, um, uh, skepticism uh, of science uh, in these countries. So when you have a president constantly talking about fake news and the news are accurately reporting what the scientific community is saying, obviously you're, you're facing a, a real problem. And so uh, the, the, the lessons about uh, social distancing, um, uh, about wearing masks, uh, have been, that the scientific community has been putting forward have been undermined uh, by the leadership in these countries. Um, I got, uh, th there were several questions about uh, the relationship uh, between uh, different strategies that different countries have pursued. Um, one aspect of that is the question of, did the, the lockdowns cause the economic slowdown, or was it in fact the disease itself that caused the economic slowdown? And at this juncture, the answer is pretty clear, that it is the fear uh, that people have of going to a restaurant, flying on an airplane, uh, that have, are at the center of the economic slowdown. Uh, and that the lockdowns are the appropriate response because the lockdowns are the ways that we uh, reduce the spread of the disease and therefore reduce 
the pandemic, uh, and it's only by controlling the pandemic that we will be able to uh, restore uh, economic prosperity. And that's why countries that uh, had both trust and uh, that that uh, m managed the pandemic well, like New Zealand, among the countries that have been least affected by uh, the pan the econ uh, uh, in terms of their economy by the pandemic itself. There were some questions about uh, uh, elaborating a little bit on uh, the uh, green uh, recovery. Um, what kinds of things uh, are there that uh, uh, one can do? And different countries have, have uh, done uh, different things uh, reflecting their, their uh, uh, circumstances. For instance, in New Zealand, uh, waiters and waitresses uh, in some of the resort areas that are located in beautiful natural parks uh, are uh, being redeployed to help improve the parks because the tourists aren't coming. Uh, rather than having those workers idle, the question is, how do you use those resources today uh, in ways that can lead to long-run returns. In a way, it echoes what happened in the Great Depression in the United States, where civilian conservation corps, government employment programs, created a legacy from which we are still benefiting 80 years later. Uh, another example is uh, in uh, South Korea, their re green recovery, uh, focusing a lot on some of the new innovation areas uh, that they hope to uh, lead the world in, uh, hydrogen cities, uh, the development of hydrogen technology. And some countries in Europe are, are following uh, that uh, strategy as well. There's a lot of need for creating uh, 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 housing with uh, 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 Renew, uh, better, more dependent on renewable energy. So uh, installation of solar panels uh, takes some of the uh, labor that might otherwise be used uh, um, and redeploys it to create, to reduce our dependence on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, public transportation systems need to be constructed to reduce our dependence on um, uh, fossil fuels. So what I wanna highlight here is that there are uh, programs that are short-term, that are medium-term, that are long-term, that can uh, engage labor today that would have been otherwise unemployed in making constructive contributions for the long-term uh, and ways that uh, uh, achieve, help achieve the sustainable development goals, in particular, uh, help address the problems of climate change. Uh, one of the questions that, that uh, has been asked uh, has to do with the, uh, the particular problems that developing countries like India uh, face. Um, the mistake that was made in India uh, was that they adopted very quickly a strong lock lockdown, but they were not sensitive to what the implications of that would be given their circumstances. People have to live. And uh, the way the lockdown was uh, conducted led to large high levels of migration as, as people were forced to return to their villages. And as they migrated, of course, that spread the disease around the country, leading to uh, a high, a very high level number of uh, 
uh, individuals uh, coming down with the disease and large numbers of individuals uh, dying. Um, a similar kinds of lack of sensitivity uh, occurred in, in Bolivia, uh, where uh, the right-wing government uh, was not sensitive to the different circumstances in different parts of the country. So um, it is interesting in my mind that uh, many of the more democratic governments have done such a much better job than uh, many of the uh, countries led by demagogues, uh, countries where uh, governments have tried to divide society uh, rather than uh, develop greater solidarity among the citizens. Um, did you want to take any of the questions sure. about how we can improve multilateral co cooperation or how developing countries can get access to finance? Well, actually, uh, I think problems are likely to get worse for many of the developing countries in emerging markets. Uh, one of the things that's happened both in Europe and particularly in the United States was an enormous increase in liquidity. Uh, I referred a little earlier to the balance sheet, uh, increase in the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Actually, there's been large savings in the part of, of Americans, uh, corporations, uh, and this savings has been looking for uh, places to, to get a return. Uh, there's been a, a, a search for yield. Um, eventually, what I worry about is that the, the, this uh, uh, flow of funds, which just like in the aftermath of the 2008-9 crisis, where there was an enormous increase in liquidity in that search of funds for yield, uh, some of those funds went to the emerging markets at some point that gets reversed. And so there may be actually at this moment uh, a sense of uh, a lack of worry because some emerging markets are having access to funds temporarily simply because of this enormous flood of liquidity. But I worry that it will be just temporary. And that's why uh, the measures that I talked about, uh, the issuance of SDRs, uh, the uh, debt restructurings, are, I think, uh, the kind of measures that are likely to, to be needed uh, uh, if we are going to get a robust recovery from this pandemic. Great. And um, there's some, a lot of questions just about how countries can prepare for pandemics, how they can fight against slowdowns. I, I know you're not an epidemiologist, so I don't know whether you really want to talk about that. Well, Do you I'm, want to talk about a little bit about Biden and the elections? Here's, here's a question about Biden's um, handling and his, his plan to deal with the pandemic. So first, let me talk about preparation uh, for a crisis. You know, uh, Whenever we have a crisis, citizens turn to government. Uh, the, um, it is one of the functions of government. Next day, so one of the functions of collective action. But 40 years of denigrating the role of government, Reagan, Thatcher, and most vividly, the last three years under President Trump in the United States has resulted in a government less capable of responding. There was a beautiful uh, book called The Fifth Risk that delineated uh, the role of government in managing risk and how, as a result of this neoliberal doctrines, uh, the capability of governments responding to the risks that we face, a whole variety of risks, uh, was undermined. Uh, ironically, uh, the one risk that was not talked about 
was the pandemic. But we had been warned. We had been warned about this risk by SARS, by MERS, uh, by Ebola. And it's worth noting that under the Obama administration, there was a White House Office of Pandemic created within the National Security Council. And why there? Because it is a national security threat. Nothing has more, done more damage to the strength of the United States than this nasty little virus. But President Trump disbanded this White House Office on pandemics. Countries need to be prepared for this and other crises that they face. Another instrument uh, in preparation of, of, a, of a disease are stockpiles. I talked before about how the pandemic has shown our society, our economy, not to be resilient. There are reasons that markets don't actually normally handle this kind of extreme event very well. And that's why governments, well-managed governments, create stockpiles. And we have stockpiles of masks and protective gear. But the Trump administration, not understanding the role of government with the Republican Party, depleted these stockpiles. And so when the pandemic hit, we didn't have an adequate supply of masks. We didn't have an adequate supply of protective gear. And they allowed our ventilators uh, to uh, uh, not be adequately maintained. When it comes to infectious diseases, of course, we have to have good institutions to combat them. And the United States used to have a first-rate institutions, the Centers for Disease Control. But under this new liberal doctrine that focused simply on the market, the Trump administration defunded the Centers for Disease Control, and we were inadequately able to respond. Couldn't develop the tests that we needed. Other countries like South Korea did a fantastic job, not only developing tests, being able to uh, test and trace, so we could, so they were able to control the disease. We didn't succeed in doing that. Now, this is where I think the Biden uh, administration is going to be a, a sea change, because there is a recognition of an important role for government in responding to crises, the climate crisis, the inequality crisis, uh, health crises. Um, one of the reasons the United States has been so badly afflicted is it's the only advanced country that doesn't recognize the right of access to health care as a basic human right. This uh, disease goes after those with poor health. Life expectancy in the United States today under Trump is lower than it was before he became the president. Uh, and health disparities are larger than in most other uh, uh, developed countries. So you need to have good systems of social protection against this and other kinds of crises. And you uh, need to have uh, uh, recognized the important role that government plays in our society. And that's been one of the main themes of my book, People, Power, and Profits, that we need a new social contract that recognizes that a successful society uh, has to be based on uh, a better balance between government, markets, and civil society. Good. Well, these were really wonderful questions, and I'm glad you were able to answer so many of them, even if not all of them. Um, so we would just like to close out and thank everybody for coming and for Columbia Global Centers and the UNDP for inviting us here today for this Kapuscinski lecture. Thanks to all and wishing you good health and uh, that a, a better time will come for all of us. Thanks so much, uh, Anya Schiffrin, Joe Stiglitz, for making time for us. Thank you, everyone, for joining. All best.